Every year, 25 million climbers find themselves clinging to the sides of steep cliffs, and it can seem like a pretty scary pursuit, but... If you look at the number of people who drive and die versus the number of people who climb and die, you realize that it's actually 150 times more dangerous on the way to the crag than it is on the crag. But it doesn't feel that way intuitively. Why is that? Most human decisions involve risk, but when the stakes are high, it turns out we're really bad at knowing what to worry about. So today, we're gonna look at why we worry about the things that won't kill us while missing the things that will. And hopefully, at the end of it all, you'll walk away with a better sense of what's actually worth worrying about and how to train that intuition. When we think about risk, what we're actually thinking about is the balance between fortune and misfortune. Most of the time, people make the trade-off without even being aware of it. But the problem is, is that they often come to unreasonable conclusions. Parents are more likely to let their kids play football than they are to let them smoke marijuana. Presumably, this is because they believe that marijuana is more dangerous than football. But the data actually shows the opposite. Not only has degenerative brain disease been found in 88 to 99% of American football players, between seven and 20 kids die playing the game every year. On the other hand, weed has never directly killed a single user, and no study has definitively shown that it causes long-term damage. Other people prefer natural gas to nuclear power, even though a year of combustion pollution causes 40 times the fatalities of the same year of nuclear power. People fear guns, which cause 40,000 deaths a year in the United States, but not medical error, which kills anywhere between 90 and 250,000 people a year. They fear COVID, but not driving down the street, which poses at least the same risk to those below the age of 45. Our ability to accurately evaluate risk gets worse the more scared we are. In the aftermath of three buildings coming down on September 11th, people turned to driving instead of flying. The idea being that they didn't want to die as the result of an airborne terrorist attack, so they took matters into their own hands. This mismatch in perceived risk versus actual risk is thought to be responsible for an extra 150 fatal car crashes every month for a year after 9-11. What the drivers didn't realize is that even with what happened on 9-11, a car trip between LA and Boston is 250 times more dangerous than the flight. What unites all of these cases is the way people's irrational fears of guns, sharks, viruses, weed, terrorism, they're all stoked from an external locus. Think pieces in newspapers, talking heads on the TV, the drama of movies, nightly news. They're all resonant little transmitters that reach into our brains and amplify an ancient and powerful reaction called dread risk. In the late 1970s, a group of scientists from Decision Research became interested in the question of what people feared. Our research is descriptive, they wrote. It aims to discover what people mean when they say that something is risky. To figure this out, they asked participants to evaluate everything from spray cans to nuclear war in terms of absolute risk, and then to explain why each item was risky. What they found was that most people's fears were best captured in two dimensions, uncertainty and dread. Uncertainty risks were things like DNA research, space exploration, solar power, events that were new, undertaken involuntarily, whose consequences are delayed, and which seem not fully known to science or to those exposed. On the other hand, dread risks were things like terrorism, nerve gas, and war, which appeared to relate to consequences that are likely to be catastrophic, that are certain to be fatal, and feel dreaded on a gut level. They also found that, across the board, people seemed much more scared of dread risks than of uncertain risks. And in the decades since, this has been used to show just how irrational we humans are. But that doesn't seem to be the complete story. Why shouldn't we fear things like war and terrorism? In evolutionary terms, they have been more than capable of wiping out an entire lineage. By destroying populations in an age-indiscriminate way, the events that evoke dread risk threaten the tribe. This is unlike ordinary risk, like heart attacks, degenerative brain disease, and cancer, which usually come for those who can no longer reproduce. From this perspective, a desire to avoid dread risk doesn't seem irrational. It seems more like a hard-baked awareness of the potential for what Nassim Taleb calls black swan events, a type of wild risk. 
These are events in the fat tail region of the Pareto distribution, which do not regress to the mean, which are not smoothed into a normal curve by the law of large numbers. In other words, these are the rare events that have, over evolutionary history, shaped the course of all life on Earth. So, we pattern match war and pandemics to some ancient reptile brain memory of our tribe dying, and we're afraid it might happen again, right in front of us. I take the threat very seriously. I take the fact that he develops weapons of mass destruction very seriously. The real irrationality lies in how this fear makes us vulnerable to making bad decisions that go far beyond our own lives. The original decision research study on dread risk found that the more that an event is dreaded, the more people want it to be regulated, sanitized, and cleansed. This was obvious in the aftermath of September 11th, when a full 50% of people polled by Gallup suggested that they wanted the government to fight terrorism, even if it meant violating their civil liberties. Fear of terrorism enabled the government to implement the Patriot Act, subvert the Freedom of Information Act, and to allow warrantless search and seizure all around the country. The subterfuge that plays upon dread risks to get public support for an unpopular move plays out over and over again through history. The Nazis faked Polish aggression against Germany to justify invasion. The CIA ran Operation Ajax. The US Navy, under the command of this guy's dad, faked the Gulf of Tonkin incident to start the Vietnam War, and there's even reason to believe that Putin orchestrated the Moscow apartment bombings to ensure his election to prime minister, a post that he has occupied ever since. These events were all opportunities for someone, or something, to seize money, power, control, whatever, by fanning the flames of fear in order to get popular support for invasion, for election, or for revolution. And this works because fear is the most effective population level motivator. The same thing's happening today, but with a fresh crop of dread risks. Fear of a dreaded respiratory virus has caused us to lean into digital surveillance that ensures the hold of tech companies over our lives. Fear of misinformation leads to a rising tide of censorship that secures corporate power. Fear of rising carbon dioxide levels may still lead us to solar geoengineering in an effort to block out the sun. Knowing all that, there's just one question. What do we do about it? At the end of the day, the goal is to know what is worth being afraid of. One approach to eradicating unnecessary fear is to become more rational, as championed by the eponymously named Bay Area Rational Community, also known by us as... Bark? Oof. And their thinking is outlined in the Less Wrong sequences, Astro Codex 10, and the book Scout Mindset, all of which propose the best defense against being cowed by the numbers is to develop a strong sense of how to think clearly, so that your perception actually matches reality. This doesn't come naturally to most people. At last count, there are over 200 different cognitive biases on record, but it is an ability that can be trained. In addition to identifying and escaping faulty systems of thinking, the key is to create accountability. Some people prefer to do this in physical prediction journals, others accumulate social credit at websites like Metaculus, and others put their money where their mouth is at places like Polymarket and Manifold, but everywhere the principle is the same. Make predictions and check them against reality. When they diverge, go back and figure out the factors that clouded your judgment to avoid them in the future. It's the same principle used by successful stockbrokers and crypto jocks, but expanded to consider the outcome of world events. Another approach comes from a group of people that researchers have identified as super forecasters, those who make 30% more accurate predictions than professional intelligence analysts with access to classified information. But even though the Good Judgment Project's super forecasters are excellent at predicting the future, they aren't always right. At least some of this error has to do with the impossibility of finding a pure number. All statistics are subject to enormous bias. Even if we set ourselves to the task of eliminating bias that we know is there, it's an asymptotic goal, much like reaching for absolute zero. Observer bias is also very common, where issues with how the questions are asked, ranging from the enthusiastic face of the experimenter prompting a given response, like in the case of Clever Hans, or even in phrasing of the question. Asking how someone feels about a procedure with a 90% survival rate is not the same thing as asking how they feel about something that has a 10% death rate. But let's say you figure it out. You get a perfect data set. It turns out you're still hosed because statistics can't really tell you about the likelihood of rare events. 
There's no base rate for something that happens only once every thousand years. Other times they don't work out because a given statistic is true generally, but not true specifically. Like the claim that if you're above 65, you have a higher risk of heart disease. This is true. But just how true depends on how well you take care of your body. Taking care of yourself can significantly reduce that risk. And while we have the data on heart attacks, most stats don't have that kind of fine-grained detail that can help you evaluate your personal risk. Even if you make it through all of this by having a sufficiently fine-grained data set, how do you pick the right data to make a prediction? Well, if you have enough data points, the logic goes, you should be able to build a perfect model of the most likely future. But that doesn't seem to be how it works. Consider the Google Flu Tracker, a project aimed at predicting the severity of upcoming flu seasons by tracking search queries. The designers believe that by tracking 146 different flu-related keywords, they'd be able to estimate the number of flu visits in the following week. Instead, their model overestimated visits during peak flu season by as much as 2x and completely failed to detect the 2009 H1N1 outbreak, which fell outside of a normal flu season. What actually worked to predict the number of flu cases each week was to look at a small window of very recent information, the number of flu visits in the previous two weeks. The smaller slice of information, boosted by the power of recency, allowed investigators to accurately predict the number of cases. This suggests that informed intuition, which is a gut feeling that uses a little bit of information to make a prediction, makes us smarter than putting together a model that contains every variable that we can think of. But what about situations where it's hard to even get good data because it's missing, incomplete, or corrupted? Like this cliff I'm hanging from. Even if by most accounts rock climbing is safer than driving a car, it still looks pretty scary. Until you get this piece of information. Informed intuition can only get us pretty far, but at some point we run into the problem of corrupted or absent key data, which if remedied might change the balance of what we are actually afraid of. When the data available to us is limited to what's passed through the well-known content filters of Google, Snopes, or PolitiFact, we're operating under a monochromatic lamp. Our vision is bandwidth limited. This is because the job of a fact checker and the job of a researcher are very different. The fact checker compares what is written against the reference manual. But the researcher is doing work that only some decades from now might end up in that manual. Now, not all contemporary research will make the cut, but all work that does began as speculation. And all of it, even the ideas that are way off the mark, do end up contributing to a better understanding of the world in the end. So. Outright blocking the dispersal of knowledge that has not yet risen to the level of reference material is a terrible idea full stop. The problem is that normally people don't really have time to figure this out. Work takes time, so does family, so does hanging out on YouTube. So instead, we worry about the most visible dread risks, the ones that show up on the news, reported on because they get clicks and the ad revenue flows. Not necessarily because they're the biggest threats, and this has been the status quo for a long time, maybe since print journalism first appeared. But the world is changing, and nuance is making a comeback. Traditional news media is cratering. Independent journalism is rising. The biggest podcast in the world hosts three-hour-long conversations. People seem like they're interested in reality rather than the same stories that just tickle their dread. To this end, we've been cultivating some long-form content ourselves at the Demystifying Science Podcast, where we explore the edges of what's known with a diverse array of thinkers and theorists. Walking this landscape, we must know our threats, since that's the only way to avoid disaster. Instinctively, we know to avoid the familiar risks we have lived with for ages, war, terrorism, and disease. What's new today are the hidden dread risks that threaten the fragile democracies that are only a few generations old. To fight against the silent risks of losing our access to free and open information, take the time out of your day to support independent media. This is not an abstract request. We need your help right now at our Demystify Sci Patreon so we can make better and better videos and podcasts. There is a whole world we want to explore with you, a realm of knowledge we want to bring you, so please become our patron. But don't stop there. Seek out others that will express the values that will make for a stronger future. 
competence, cooperation, compassion, and openness, rather than the ones that will beat on the drum of fear. We'll be right there with you, fighting the good fight. See you next time, humans.